back to the Health Edition of Talk TV. I'm Dr. Carl Cavassell, and I'm here with Dr. Peter, Pierre Major from the Hamilton Regional Cancer Center, John Colacci, a colorectal cancer survivor, and we're joined on the phone by Barry Stein, president of the Colorectal Cancer Association of Canada. Um, before the break, we were just talking about screening, and um, John, you're, you're a young man. Yes. Every person, uh, man or woman, above the age of 50 should begin to be screened on a regular basis, but you were actually diagnosed uh, at what age? Well, that would have been uh, 40. At age 40. So That's correct. So you, you didn't, uh, you sort of, as you were saying earlier, came under the radar exactly. in a sense, right? The doctor told me that 99 point percent, it's not what you think it is. And I was reassured, you know, it was a doctor telling me this, so I went home not too worried about it. Yeah, your doctor was playing the averages, basically. Exactly. It was unlikely that you had colon cancer. I just looked too healthy. You did. You looked so too healthy. a cancer patient. <laughs> right. So I, I think, actually, that really sort of underscores the importance of uh, advocating for yourself when That's you know right. that something's wrong in your body. Um, but, uh, Dr. Major, it's also important for people to recognize this, the signs and symptoms. So yes. if something's not quite right, what, what might somebody feel if they have colon well, cancer? Well, it could be as vague as, as abdominal comfort, feel like you're full, you're bloated, uh, you have some pain, and it persists for more than a few weeks. Now, everybody has got aches and pains that are transient, don't last for a long time. But if you feel like your bowels have changed, you used to be regular once a day, and now it's every third day, uh, there's some discomfort in the abdomen, you should bring it to medical attention if it lasts more than a few weeks because it might be the, an early sign that something is wrong in your bowels and right. that it might be cancer. Okay. Well, and of course, if you have blood, that's a very worrisome sign that's that a you red should flag. not ignore. Absolutely. Okay, let's go to the phones and we're going to speak to Gudrun in Woodbridge. Hi, Gudrun. Hi. Hi. What's your question today? Well, I was wondering if, if someone's prone to fissures, um, is it possible that colon cancer can result or rectal cancer can result from that? From an anal fissure? Yeah. Pardon? You, you, you're saying, uh, you're asking if anal fissures are related to colon cancer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Major? Uh, not that I'm aware of, other than chronic inflammation in that area of the anus can lead to cancer of the anus, but that's... Uh, the, the link is very, very remote, so no, I wouldn't make a link between fissures and rectal cancer. But the issue is when if there's rectal bleeding, it can't simply be assigned to an obvious finding like a hemorrhoid or a fissure. It needs to be investigated, particularly if the person is over the age of 50. Better be safe than sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, that's something to keep in mind. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks for your call, Gudrun. We're going to speak next to Roman in Toronto. Hi, Roman. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Oh, not too bad now. I, uh, I, I uh, am a cancer patient just like uh, John is there. Yeah. And I had a very, very positive experience by uh, using Avastin. I, I became surgically a surgical candidate for past disease where I wasn't before that. Of course, I had to spend $25,000. And I, my question is, why is not Ontario paying for this, whereas B.C. and a number of the other provinces are paying for it? And, and before I, I go to that, to let them answer the question, I'd also like to thank the drug companies who have compassionate programs because they do help us cover the cost of some of these drugs. Like Roche, in the case of Avastin, was excellent in helping me find a, a clinic to get it and also some subsidy towards the cost. Okay. That's, you know what, Roman, that's a great question. Let me bring uh, Barry Stein back into the conversation. Barry, you're on the phone. Um, Roman asks, you know, he's had some good success with Avastin. These drugs, uh, these biologicals are really revolutionizing treatment of cancer. Why, uh, why is, is it not covered in this province? Uh, you know, why does the, the ministry not see fit to do this? Well, the argument uh, is, of course, uh, economic reasons that uh, they do not uh, feel that there's enough of a cost-benefit relationship in order to provide uh, for it. However, I could tell you that in uh, Newfoundland, in Nova Scotia, in Quebec, in Saskatchewan, and in British Columbia, all these provinces are covering it because it does extend life and it is a very useful uh, mechanism to add in, or another additional treatment to add in combination with the, um, as John was talking about, fall fox, that's the five fluorosil and the oxaliplatin and, uh, and other medications. In fact, we feel so strongly about it that if you go to our website where a lot of this information is available, just go to www.colorectal, C-O-L-O-R-E-C-T-A-L, hyphen cancer, mm -hmm. dot 
ca it's on the screen you'll right see, now yeah you will see click here to join the fight and you'll get a lot of information about that in terms of requesting it for the province of ontario and other provinces in addition you'll see a lot of other information on signs and symptoms and screening and treatments and so forth in general yeah but all in all um, you know, the caller is, is, is extremely lucky to be in that subset of patients that has had an, a very excellent benefit and qualified for surgery. And that's really what we look for uh, to accomplish in all of the cases. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen in all of the cases, but certainly we have seen extreme benefit. And I can right. tell you, I just came back from the oncology convention uh, in Chicago, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and the reporting there was such that it's undeniable that there is a, a very big advantage to having the addition of this new biologic mm -hmm. or anti-angiogenic yeah. um, uh, to the addition of the chemotherapies. Okay. And if we haven't heard a little bit about that, I can tell you what this medication does is okay. that it cuts the blood supply to the tumor yeah. and stops it from growing. And uh, it's, it's just fascinating new technology. Absolutely. Okay, Roman, thanks for your call. We're going to uh, take uh, Desmond's uh, call next. Desmond in Toronto, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, what's your question? Yes, um, I've been, I have an, I had an accident a few years ago that caused me to see many specialists in different fields. And I've seen a urologist that told me that I seem to have some gene in me that I am not susceptible in having cancer. And I really would like to have more information on that. Mm -hmm. Do you know what particular type of cancer, Desmond? Well, he was checking for colon cancer mm -hmm. and several times, but he told me that, uh, he said, good news, I have good news for you. There's something in me that I am not susceptible to in getting cancer. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Dr. Pierre. Um, well, I just don't have enough of the specifics to really comment on. There are right. genes which predispose people to having colon cancer, and they tend to run in families. Yeah. Uh, and the most commonly known is the hereditary non polyposis colon cancer, which gives rise to cancer uh, from the normal bowel in a, you know, more than half the, the people who carry the gene, and if they live long enough, about 80% of them will get, they develop cancer. Right. And there are other also genes that can give rise to cancer. In terms of this call, in terms of protecting against cancer, uh, I'm not familiar with that, so I can't right. well, comment. I think, I think Desmond's saying that maybe his doctor looked for that gene does not guarantee that you wouldn't Absolutely colon cancer? not. Most of the colon cancers arise in people who don't have any genetic predisposition. Maybe 5% are in people who have a, the, the genes that make them more likely to have colon cancer, but the vast yeah. majority do not have them. And, and John, you, in your case, do, you don't have any genetic link? Uh, do, well, do, first of all, did they test you for genes, for yes. uh, col colorectal cancer genes? What did they find? Uh, they found that there was no relation. It was just something that had happened to me, but it's not something that actually ran in my family or something that my children would get. However, they did say it would be, a, you know, make sense to have early screening for my kids as they get older. Absolutely. If okay. I can add to that, uh, yeah. Carl, one of the most interesting things about some of the findings of, uh, of some of the geneticists and so forth that we see in Canada is that the genetic testing is not, at this point, helping patients to this, or helping the public to determine whether or not they're predisposed mm -hmm. to getting colorectal cancer, although there are some early uh, phase products out there which now have a once-in-a-lifetime predictive factor. Mm -hmm. But um, where it really seems to be playing a role is in those patients who are diagnosed with the disease, they can then uh, help them determine whether or not there is a genetic factor and whether other members of their family should be screened right. earlier yeah. than we would have otherwise have done so. Thank you, Barry. Yeah, th I think that's important to say that there is no genetic test that someone can take beforehand to tell them whether or not they're going to get, uh, in other words, there's, there's no screening test at a genetic level for colon cancer. Not yet available. Not yet available. It's not okay. yet available, but I have to say I just visited with one of the uh, one of the newer companies who are looking in the field, and there are three or four new companies that are looking at predictive factors. There is one in Saskatoon, mm -hmm. which has a blood serum test, and another one in Toronto also with a blood serum test. Okay. And then there's one based on spit, believe it or not, for a once-in-a-lifetime prognostic factor. These are all in their early stages. Okay. It's time for a short break here on Talk TV. We still have a lot more show ahead of us, so call us now. We'll be right back.